when our founding fathers brought forth this nation, they were working very definitely uh, to achieve the advancement of the policy of humanism that was developing in Europe. It centered around the concept of the rights of the human being, that the individual had inalienable rights before God and nature, and that these rights must be recognized on the level of political leadership. As it developed gradually down through the first 50 years of our national existence, it began to appear that freedom was gradually developing in the right into the right to be wrong. In other words, freedom largely became a symbol of doing as we please, without regard for consequences or for the rights of others. Freedom was the inalienable right of the individual to do that which he desired to do. And the problem of a national existence was to develop some form of political structure which would enable each individual to be a rugged individualist. Now this was difficult. In fact, it has never been solved. And we observe around us today the results of numerous efforts on the parts of nations, especially smaller nations, to escape from bondage to major powers, the gradual disintegration of colonial empires. And in almost every instance, the newly liberated community turned upon itself and abused its own privileges. When we come into the life of the individual, we have the same general situation. There is scarcely anything that anyone can do today that someone else will not object to. To be different is to be wrong. And to differ from a personal opinion of someone else is to be open to all types of ridicule and persecution. The idea has gradually developed that we were born into this world to do exactly as we pleased, and that anyone who interfered with this is a tyrant. Nature and experience both demonstrate that this concept is wrong. But unless the individual is able to discipline himself, he must be disciplined by someone else, or the structure of his communities will fall apart. So in today, where there is very little incentive for self-discipline in the popular ways of doing things, it is necessary for us to take over this situation as persons and recognize that we must enforce certain rules in our own conduct. We must think through the problems of our own existence. We must plan. We must organize resources. We must live within capacities and abilities, or we will be in trouble forever. To meet this challenge, we have to begin with perhaps the most common unit, and that is the family. We know that today children are ever less willing to follow parental guidance. They consider their forebears to be obsolete. They consider their own privileges and rights as inalienable, and more and more resent any infringement upon their privileges. And if these privileges mean the, mean the right to do wrong, they insist that this is their proper 
destiny. One of the main difficulties here, of course, is that today we are trying to discipline young people too late. By the time the child is 10 or 12 years old, the chances of disciplining it thoroughly are very remote. And if we wait until the child does something that is so dangerous or improper that we must take notice of it, it is too late to correct the situation. So we follow the only course that nature has left open to us, realizing that we cannot change these people once their characters are formed. We must return the job to the universal law itself. We must take these people whom we can no longer control and turn them back to heaven to take care of. The laws of, na of nature and the laws of living will ultimately force uh, these radicals back into some type of social pattern. But we may never live to see it, and before this happens, there may be desperate dangers to the social structure. Now, we all like to do what we please. And more and more, we live by this concept. It is aided and abetted by a series of other circumstances. One of the most important being the insecurities of the present generation. We live at a time... And to many people, the only answer to the successful life is to have as much as you can get right now. Enjoy it all you can right now. And have very little hope or expectancy for the future. This also leads gradually to a demoralization of character. The individual lacking social securities and lacking security within himself is an easy victim to a whole group of psychological and psychotic ailments. When he becomes so disturbed and so uncomfortable that he can no longer live with himself, it does not always occur to him to change himself. Rather, he goes on psychotic drugs of one kind or another, to reduce his pressures by putting them to sleep rather than by solving them. This situation does add to the general insecurity. Another factor that is very important in our way of life is what we commonly call the concept of wealth. In our way of life here at the present time, wealth takes the place of the autocratic privileges of the past. In ancient times, it was believed that rulers governed by the divine right of kings. Today, we assume that rulers govern by the divine right of dollars. Whoever has enough of them can do as he pleases. Little by little, we have turned all our faith in the direction of accumulation. We have taken it for granted that we are here to get as much as we can, give as little as possible, work when we have to, but avoid it if possible. This uh, philosophy is not necessarily a very good one. There's a story told of a man in his 80s who was interviewed as to the circumstances that had made it possible for him to have such a long life. The man said, well, I had a business, and after a certain length of time, I made $10 million and sold the business. The man I sold it to made 300 million, and he's dead. He left it to another man who doubled it, and he's dead. 
Therefore, the prime note for this person was, if your paper wishes to have something to say about the party they were interviewing, he said, just say that I can still walk every day in Central Park. Now today, in building and piling up these enormous fortunes, the individual destroys himself. Yet it never occurs to him to discipline this type of pressure. It never occurs to him to realize that beyond this world, he can take nothing of this pressure belonging that he has accumulated. If it is true that after death there is nothing, then there is really very little good in having too much here now, because it is all going to be forgotten. And the rich and the poor will fall asleep in the same oblivion. If there is something beyond here, it is then as obvious that whatever that is, is not wealth. We cannot take it with us. No matter what philosophy we follow, it ends, as far as possessions are concerned, when we depart here from this uh, place. Under such conditions, why this mad traffic for wealth? Why this tremendous willingness to sacrifice everything, drench the world in blood, try to satisfy the ambitions of individuals of uncertain integrity, when it all ends in darkness? The whole philosophy is wrong, and therefore, in an effort to maintain a false goal, we have frustrated the natural right of the individual to be happy. In order to be happy, it is necessary to be disciplined. Socrates pointed out very clearly that the great rule of life is in nothing too much. In all things, only enough. To possess too much is to be a slave to possession. To lack the necessity is to be a slave to privation. To have enough is to free the life from all the stress and strain of unreasonable attitudes and actions and liberate the mind for the contemplations of values above the level of wealth. Now, a great many modern thinkers are trying to solve this problem of wealth. They believe that if we could solve that, we would be in a position to build a utopian culture. Unfortunately, that does not necessarily follow. Wealth is a symbol of a basic attitude. And if currency or investments, stocks and bonds were all suddenly removed, we would then gradually and inevitably develop a new theory of wealth. Because to us, wealth is, the, is power. And to possess that which gives privilege is the most important thing in, li in life. There seems to be this trait in human nature. The willingness of the individual to die for the things that he wants in order to live well. This type of frustration is always difficult. To begin a political society that can survive, we have to begin to think in a different way. We have to decide in ourselves what constitutes a good life. What are the privileges that freedom bestows? One of the most important privileges is the privilege of being right. In the past, there were all kinds of laws and rules that made it difficult for us to be right. Our ancestors came to this country 
to escape tyrannies that prevented them from having normal and reasonable self-expressions. They wanted to escape tyranny and slavery and serfdom. They wanted the right to be a person. They wanted the right to live as individuals. And as soon as that right was at least in part given to them, they began to encroach upon each other's privileges, assuming that the right to do as we please is part of freedom. It is not. It is that factor which almost inevitably will lead freedom back to slavery. To uh, develop our own thinking now, we are living in very confused and hazardous times. And it is marked notably that a frenzy has developed. A frenzy which is leading to inflation. A frenzy which is causing every individual to be the victim of other individuals. Every possible means of exploiting man is being pressed forward by man himself. It has become a battlefield of pressures under which the average person uh, breaks down psychologically and physically. All of it shows that what we have interpreted as freedom is license to exploit. Now, this is not easy to correct, but lots of things can be done if the individual will start to exercise the true privileges of freedom. If he is free to live according to his own convictions, he has the right to grow the right to be more, the right to be better. Now, in the first 100, 150 years of our national life, this right to be better was still remembered fairly well. But now the right to be better is fading away. And one of the reasons it's fading away is that we are losing track of what constitutes better. We are not sure anymore how to grow, or in what direction growth should lead. We are not convinced any longer that growth is the unfoldment of the potential of the individual. One of the things that is inhibiting this factor, which our ancestors were more aware of, has been the gradual decline of the religious leadership of older days. Religion was one of the most powerful factors in directing human effort. And when religion was strong, powerful, and well diffused throughout society, the individual enjoyed the strength of his religious environment. He was surrounded by people who kept the rules who had the ideals and dreams that were essentially right, and he therefore had a security or strength of number. It was more difficult for him to be dishonest in those days than it is now. It was more difficult for him to be immoral, because morality was a clearly defined standard, and to leave that standard or to break it was to disgrace self and to lose caste. In other words, individuals with religious allegiances formed the fear group, and all others wished to be part of this fear group. Today, the leadership of a group of solid, intelligent, dedicated persons is failing. They simply are not the kind that we find when we turn, for example, in leadership. We find that every effort is being made continuously 
to lower the threshold of human integrities. We realize that there is a constant effort to destroy, tear down, and disillusion us about those values which are essentially correct. Instead of being applauded for our honesty, we are apt to be ridiculed for it. Instead of being defended for our proprieties, we are accused simply of being too weak to be bad. This type of attitude, of course, is tied, tied very closely to our educational theory. Education, which should help us to administer freedom, is now one of the most powerful instruments in establishing and maintaining bondage. Education is teaching us to be slaves, teaching us to follow the prescribed policies of our time, and more and more educational institutions are compromising ethics in order to perpetuate the present prevailing practices. We have a very definite situation here that needs a considerable amount of remedy. There is some kind of a pattern of irresponsibility that is being furthered and advanced uh, by what we term educational structure. Also, education is largely the result of observed phenomena. Education has something to do with the books we read. It has to do with the dramas we see, the music we listen to, the pictures we observe in libraries and museums. Uh, the environment is very largely a force in determining our taste. We observe that on all these levels, values are failing. Uh, more and more, uh, everything is used to preserve uh, the decadence that is becoming more and more prevalent. One thing, for example, I signed a statement a couple of days ago to try to pres help to preserve and protect the religion and philosophy department from the Los Angeles Public Library. There's a move on foot, at least in some part of the situation. I'm not fully informed, but I signed the petition anyway. To the effect that religion and philosophy were to become subdivisions within the social sciences. In other words, the major sections in the major sections of the library out. Now, on what grounds is this done? I would like to suggest that if the library is out of funds, and Proposition 13 is working a hardship on our public library system, that one of the most interesting and possibly profitable things the library could do is to eliminate the fiction department. <laughs> Actually, the fiction department is at variance with the basic principles of libraries. We could not look back on the Serapium or the Brachium in Alexandria and get very much excited over its fiction departments. It didn't have any. The great libraries of Europe were all founded before there was fiction. The great collections of books were collected for one purpose only, the preservation of knowledge. And today, uh, the uh, publishers are deluging us with books that contribute to nothing, that merely represent emotional reading, that are oriented to a moral standard far too low, are dealing with scandal, gossip, and all kinds of social prejudices and conceits, and the community is paying to have these precious volumes encased in the library. If you want fiction, it is available in paperback. 
Nearly anyone can afford it who wants it. But it is not essential to the advancement of knowledge. We might as well say that the public library should issue free tickets for baseball games, bowling alleys, billiard parlors. If it is here merely to serve the amusement of the public, then it is not serving the public as it should. Fiction is entertainment. Libraries are not intended to give free entertainment. They are intended to communicate useful ideas. And essential to specialists in various fields. But if by some chance the specialists in modern fiction are somewhat deprived, I think they will recover. We could take almost any public library in the United States and trim it down. And if we preserve the principle behind libraries, we'd still have room on the shelves for a lot of more books. Because we'd get rid of trash reading, which as far as our mental uh, education, stimulation, and nutrition are concerned, uh, these, these fields are just about as valuable as heavy carbohydrates and junk foods. We are getting much mental junk food. And the people who love it have not the discrimination to know that it is no good for them. So they continue to read this type of thing. And the institutions, instead of leading the public mind, cater to it. Instead of the library helping the individual to establish a standard of proper thinking, the library buys millions of books simply to cater to no standard, or to a standard that should never be tolerated, let alone catered to. So here's where the freedom comes in. If the fiction department was taken out, the library would no doubt be picketed. Every group would be there to defend its own particular specialty. And whether that specialty is any good or not, nobody cares. It is the right of the individual to read the worst literature on earth if he wants to. Or to go to see any motion picture or play that he wants to see, regardless of how bad it is in terms of public good. So this is where we are in bondage to a concept of freedom that is basically wrong. In order to correct this situation, we have to realize that we head into a tremendous economic structure, a structure that is getting richer every moment by catering to the bad taste of people. As long as the individual prefers to buy that which is not good, he will not get anything better. The only way that this problem can be really solved is by the individual or the collective group, which we call a citizenry, interprets freedom as the right to stand up for principles. This is very important. If we use our freedom to demand that which is best for all concerned, or use our freedom to discriminate and to protect our own children and their children from compromise and and corruption, if we use our freedoms correctly, we can have what we need. Because even the hopelessly involved financially minded person will give the public what it wants but the problem of leadership is to prepare the public to want what it needs this situation is coming home to all of us more and more it's coming home to us in this gasoline emergency it is coming to us in the problems of energy It is coming to us in the problem of treaties in Vienna. 
It is coming to us in revolutions all over the earth. The individual must either side with that which is secure, right, and proper, and stand ready to protect it, or we will all slowly drift together from one emergency to another. We can't go along without some facts and baggage. If we go back to the natural world in which we live, and which, of course, is the basic textbook for most thoughtful persons, we observe that nature does bestow a great deal of freedom. Nature more or less creates an adequate environment, but it is a controlled environment. It adjusts creatures to this environment, both in terms of their structures and in terms of their numbers. Nature has an interrelating system by means of which gradually two situations arise. Survival depends upon first strength. And as the strength pattern is gradually out overgrown or outgrown, then the second factor of survival comes in, and that is judgment, wisdom. All creatures must survive because they are strong enough to survive, or they are wise enough to survive. Those which break this rule, or these rules, suffer as a consequence. In nature, that which is not strong enough physically uh, to meet the challenge of environment perishes. And in this way, uh, nature preserves almost indefinitely the vitality strain of practically every living creature. Only the best survives. Only the best reproduce or perpetuate. And by this means, nature, by pressing upon the environment, uh, is able to regulate or protect uh, the survival of the species itself. The second thing that nature tells us is that every form of life, in order to survive, has to learn. Now, it's interesting that the most basic learning which we find in nature is silent learning. Learning is not read out of books by birds and bugs. Learning is almost all through example. Uh, the, I remember old Chief Seaton in his nature stories told so many tales of how nature teaches. How the little one is forever observing the way with which its adult parents meet the, the, the facts of life. The parents regulate. And when they have brought the young to maturity, they then demand that young person to stand on its own feet. Uh, the bird uh, casts the little one out of the nest. It will not allow spoilage. Nature is forever telling the young creature, follow the example of the parent. <coughs> Obey instinctively and inevitably. When the parent crouches down, crouch down. When the parent rushes into a thicket, rush in with it. Because all you have to do is decide you're going to disobey, and in a few minutes, you'll be dead. Now, this is a harsh way of learning, but it is very adequate. And for millions of years, nature maintained the balance of species until the human being, who was like bottom in the Midsummer Night's Dream, slow of learning, upset the entire situation. It is the human being that very largely demoralized every other kingdom of nature on this planet. 
But there's always a chance to do something about it if we want to. And conservationists are trying. But the conservationists do not always have nature's point of view. Nature isn't patting animals, birds, flowers, and fishes. It is teaching them. Teaching them the rules by which they must live. And as they, they live close to these rules, obeying the laws of their kind, they accomplish the greatest freedom that is possible in this world. Freedom is therefore the result or the reward of not making basic mistakes. It is to follow the laws of the kind to follow the rules of the seasons, and to follow the internal instincts with which all creatures have been endowed. Man is violating these rules. He feels that freedom is to be above his own instincts, to be able to go against his own conscience with impunity. The mysterious little voice that teaches the bird and the little animal comes to man apparently in the form of conscience. A realization that the individual is breaking the rule. And whenever he feels that way, he should pause and give it a consideration. And he shouldn't allow his mental attitudes to rationalize him into believing that he can break conscience with impunity. The recent visit a uh, Pope uh, Paul John, or John Paul, to Poland has been a, a very interesting experience. It shows that naturally the human being is religious. There may be different types of religion, different degrees, levels, ways of being religious. There are different sects and different rites and different ceremonies and different names. But the individual's natural instinct to venerate the universal pattern to which he belongs, to recognize the presence of a sovereign power at the source of life, this instinct has not been greatly altered by all the materialistic political theories that have ever been advanced. These theories break down because the human being cannot live with them. They result in a starvation of integrities. They destroy the inner balance of life. Therefore, in, effort, in an effort to be right, the individual continues to believe the principles that are necessary to his well-being. And if he cannot believe them publicly, he protects them privately in the inner part of his own soul. He is not going to be completely deprived of it. We have fought for a long time for freedom of religion, considering it to be one of the basic freedoms of mankind. In our present sophisticated generation, we are fighting for freedom from religion. And this is a very serious error. But freedom from religion means the gradual decay and decline of every integrity that is necessary to us. Every child coming into this world must have some type of religious education. The easiest, simplest, and most natural is that it should receive it at home, like the little animal does, and should learn to be religious by observing the practices of its mature associates. Religion begins by parental indoctrination of the young and is a heavy responsibility upon the parent because many parents are religious but are not necessarily uh, on a level of religion that can safely be communicated. It is very important that when a parent communicates religion that he leaves his biases, his prejudices, and his tolerance is out of it. And he can't do this in most cases. Religion to most individuals today means to follow the exact beliefs of those who have gone before. It does not mean a personal, voluntary commitment to a power beyond ourselves. 
It is and absorbed into memberships and creeds and sects and isms of one kind or another. Our search for freedom also uh, has to gain us freedom from the consequences of freedom. One of these is death. Today, we are very heavily in debt. Nations are in debt. Governments are in debt. Organizations are in debt. As one man said not long ago, we are a generation of people living on the interest from our own debts. We continue to borrow and borrow and on the debt. We are not living within a practical pattern of economy. We are being, however, tempted we are being incited into extravagance which we should have the strength to resist. But it is very difficult to resist the desire to have more. The discipline here is the ability to curb the freedom to spend. To know what is right and to know what is not right. I've always been interested in the fact that in the old days, back two, three, four, five thousand years, uh, the great state institutions of religion, the mysteries, were the most powerful organizations of their time. They were the church and the state. They were the sciences and the arts. They were the universities and the shrines. They were the instructors of the living and created the memorials of the dead. All knowledge, all learning was vested in these institutions. Those who entered these institutions became the leading citizens of their time. And most of the honored names that we remember out of the classical periods were initiates of these state systems bound by the most solemn obligations. There is no doubt in the world that many of the metaphysical disciplines that we have today were known to these people. And among these disciplines, self-discipline and the cultivation of internal extra-faculty perceptions were part of the curriculum. Now, in that situation... Society honored the best, although, of course, no generation was ever able to live up to its principles completely. But there was a greater approximation. And there was a strong leadership towards spiritual things, towards education. There is respect for the arts and sciences and a heavy penalty for desecrating them. If a musician composed an enharmonic or discordant piece of music, he was subject to punishment. He might be exiled from the city. He might lose his citizenship. If his music could, by any excuse or conception, contribute to the detriment of society. The same was true of architecture, of painting. Physicians made no charges. Lawyers made no charges. These things were all part of a great system of ethics. Now we can say to ourselves, what a pity it is that such a system faded away, destroyed by the rising ambitions of individuals who corrupted, destroyed, and desecrated the shrines of ancient learning. But apparently this was part of the divine plan of things. And if we think a moment, I think we can understand why it was part of the divine plan. It was because, like a child growing up, there had to come a time when we stood on our own feet. The home might be likened to one of these mystery temples. Here the small child learns to adjust itself to the physical world in which it lives. 
The home was responsible for the education of the child, for the disciplining of it. The home protected its physical needs and, to a large measure, its psychological needs. So the time comes when the individual steps out on his own. Now in the history of civilization, the decline of the mysteries, which was never complete, there have always been some secret organizations survived, but in general, uh, the decline of the mysteries occurred in order that the individual could develop the personal strength to regulate his own destiny. It was done because he had to gradually take hold of his own integrities. He could not be good because somebody put a gun to the back of his neck. He had to be right because right was right. He had to control himself from within himself and uh, develop those virtues through his own insights which had previously been supplied in form of parental or environmental protection. So out of this came gradually a new order of learning. A learning in which the individual became the master of his own destiny. The type of learning that resulted gradually in the rise of humanism. The rise of the right of the individual. The individual had to provide for his own needs. Had to gain the insights necessary to protect his own character. And had to apply from his own wisdom uh, the rules and laws which had previously been administered by the mystery institutions. Our own national existence is a case in point. We were required to move from a colonial state to a free and independent people, which meant that we had to take over the administration of our own destiny. Nature wants this. Nature is not going to permit us to be forever adolescent. But where an individual faced with the responsibility for his own destiny remains an adolescent, then the system falls apart. We must face the problem of maturity. Now, maturity is a very subtle thing. Nobody seems to know exactly what the word means. Maturity to most individuals is the attainment of voting age. When a person is old enough to vote, or old enough to get into the army and die for his country, he is an adult. Also, as soon as he begins to look like an adult, he is mistaken for one. After he becomes a little more adult, and uh, shows a few patriarchal propensities, then he is mistaken for a wise man. Oh. We assume age to have something to do with maturity. It has, but only under one condition. That the years that it took to get older were used to become wiser. If this was completely neglected, the individual can pass to the grave at 90 or 100 and still be an adolescent. An adolescent is one who lives without the realization of his own responsibilities, without knowledge or acceptance of his own duties in the community in which he lives. And the most adolescent of all is the one who thinks he's here merely to get what he can. Now, when adolescents of this kind teach younger adolescents, adolescence as a fact becomes supreme. We have to Accept the privilege, the problems of maturity. Maturity is vision, thoughtfulness. Maturity is the willing to, willingness to sacrifice freedom for right. And it's necessary to give up our personal privileges in the protection of our common good. Now we have this problem with our gasoline situation. I'm not going to try to philosophize on it because I don't think anybody seems to know what it's all about. Not completely. But we have a reasonable realization that there is some truth behind it. 
The great truth being that no matter who is responsible for the present crisis, this earth is a bottle. So far as petroleum is concerned, it's a round jaw. And sometime we're going to scrape the bottom of it. This oil supply cannot be replenished by nature at the speed in which it is being taken out of the ground by man. So someday we're going to have not only shortage, but a very desperate lack of fuel. Now, whether it's now or 50 years from now, it's going to come someday because of inevitables. And therefore, arrangements must be made to find other sources for fuel. We will. We have the ingenuity and the skill. But the transitional periods will be difficult and always have to be. Now, we can see right now what the attitude is in general. A pandemonium caused by this uh, shortage which interferes with almost everything that we do. Somewhere along the line it might be wise to realize how vulnerable we are and that we have this vast complicated structure of civilization which can be ruined by a little uh, pollution in the air, can be ruined by contamination of water, and can ruined by lack of fuel and energy power. We have this tremendously vulnerable thing that we have built higher and higher, and our entire survival depends upon insecure factors. The answer, of course, has to be that we will adjust as graciously as possible to the needs of the time. We will have to begin to recognize that this program of expansion and exploitation cannot go on forever. The sooner we stop it, the less painful it will be. If we wait till a common emergency forces it, the result may be devastating. Self-discipline, right here now, is one of the facts. Self-discipline against the impulse to profit from emergencies. Self-discipline to prevent us from trying to dominate a situation and take that which belongs to someone else. Self-discipline in the moderate use of whatever we have so that its values and virtues can be expanded as long as possible. The constant um, removal of values, uh, this constant destruction of ordinary implements, of ordinary commodities, the uh, uh, commodity that is created to wear out as soon as possible. All these things are basically destroying our natural resources. So the person has a right to live as nearly adequately as possible. But above adequacy, he must begin to discipline. When he has what he needs and reasonable luxuries that are not dangerous to his survival, this is as far as he can go. And beyond this point, he is tearing down the structure of his entire social order. So freedom here, again, has to be controlled. Freedom to do as you please must mean that we please to do what is right. And in small things, we can all practice this, even though we are not uh, able, perhaps, to immediately change governmental patterns. Confucius died of a broken heart in China, and among his last words were that he found no prince who would accept his teaching and live by it. But after him came others who greatly revered and venerated those teachings, and they became one of the imperishable codes of conduct, and are even being brought back in China today. 
So everywhere it is hard to influence other people to do the things that we know to be right. But we are able to have greater influence than we suspect. What is not good, we should not support. We do not have to go into violent revolutions or anything of that nature. But when it is obvious that we are wasting, we can stop wasting. When we are being deceived or exploited, we can decline to cooperate. It may mean that we will have to go without something that we want. But if enough people go without something that they want, they will ultimately have that which they want more, that which is better for them. And uh, this is true in all the fields in which we are supporting uh, bad policies. Another form of bondage to freedom uh, is in the level of ideas within ourselves. Within each of us, there seems to be a, diff- a series of different governments functioning at the same time. We are a monarchy, and this monarchy is a spiritual power within us which is ruled by divine right. We are an oligarchy in which various functions of the body become the rulers of it. And these various functions, like communities within a state, have a certain autonomy. And in oligarchy in our bodies, the higher faculties of the body, the higher structural systems of the body, become the lawful leaders so that the body is governed by its own aristocracy, and that is oligarchy. The body is also ruled to a certain degree by a theocratic system. Uh, The uh, king is also the high priest. The theocratic system is that the power within that be regarded not only as a great life an energy principle, but as a divine being. And under this divine being, the king emperor becomes the theocratic ruler. We are also a democracy. A democracy rising from the different levels of our own interests and our own abilities. Democracy does not bestow upon us equality. It does bestow upon us equal opportunity to fulfill our own natural destinies. Democracy is to essential principles a a government by the the permission of the government. But when we study man, we're not sure we find it there even. I wonder how many of us are governed uh, with the consent of the capillaries. The limbs, whether we are governed by the consent of the heart or the liver. When it comes to these things, we are a tyranny in which willpower gives us the advantage and enables us to destroy ourselves. So we are tyrannies also. The tyranny of ambition in ourselves. And it's right to destroy the body, which destroy the mind, destroy the heart. Then we are also a communism in our own bodies. And that is what might be termed an industrialized state. A state in which all the parts uh, of the economy, which we call the body, are held in servitude to the creation of the superior self. In other words, what we are really doing is to use all our faculties and powers industrially to support the purposes of the will or of the mind. The mind makes us work 
and in turn the mind uh, gains the benefits of our labors. So that everything except the mind is a slave, existing primarily uh, to provide that which the appetites desire. Then, of course, we are subject to revolutions. Every so often, a system is so badly abused that there is a revolt. And in this, we have a parallel to the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and the American Revolution. Weary of tyrant, of tyranny, the body rebels. When this is, happens in, within the body of the individual, we call it a breakdown. We go to the hospital as a nervous wreck. The body no longer able to stand the intemperances of its rulers and the faculties and facilities of the body being constantly exploited to gratify the divine right of princes, our ambitions. Finally, there is a revolution. And in this revolution, we turn the structure inside out or upside down. And we start over again. And after a revolution, we come out of the hospital with a strong resolution to live well. And in three months, completely forget it. Now, we also have a socialism. And socialism in the body is that the body should produce all that is necessary and that this necessity should be distributed throughout all the parts of the body so that nothing is lacking that is necessary. And above a certain point, all production by the individual parts there should be pooled or made into an available reservoir for the advancement of culture. In other words, there should be a limit upon the industrial expansion of the individual or his of his institutions. He should do a certain amount and the overage should all go into a common fund for the common good. There is a single taxer and a mugwump in each one of us. All hard at work doing something. And then every once in a while there comes along something that is pure anarchy. An anarchy is the rebellion of the individual against his own needs. An anarchy is what the individual says, I shall do as I please regardless of what it costs. It may destroy health, it may break home, it may alienate children, it may destroy the country, but I shall do what I please. And what do I please to do? I please to run other people. I want to use all my resources to dominate someone else. This individual is going to find his anarchy falls apart because in the last analysis, the only person he can ever actually dominate is himself. When he tries outside of himself, there's a revolution. A revolution has been the pet way in which human beings have tried to grow for a long time. And one of the things that you look back over history and you realize that in many instances revolutions have been so unnecessary. Nearly everything that a revolution accomplishes would have occurred of its own accord within 50 to 100 years because of the inevitable motion of civilization itself. The tyrannies which we rise against would have ironed themselves out not right immediately, but in the course of time. Growth would have overcome. But instead of of having revolution as a means of change, we're gradually going to be taught that we can't afford them. Now, it used to be that we couldn't afford them for moral reasons. But then morality fell apart, and then something else came along. Now we can't afford them because we haven't the energy resources to sustain them. A, uh, in the future, revolutions are going to take more petroleum than we have. They're going to take more of other things. They're going to devastate and destroy the crops. We're going to make our land unsuitable for tillage for centuries. Little by little, the revolution theory 
is destroying itself. It is a monster like the serpent of old that swallows its own tail. Instead of that, we must have the next step. And the only positive step, and that is not revolution, but revelation. We must begin to understand. In order to understand, we have to find some way of creating within ourselves the capacity to understand. We can get it in various ways. One way we can get it is by simply reading history. We can see what has happened by, to those who didn't understand. And as we find uh, in the reading Gibbons, define and fall, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which most people really should read, I strongly advise it. Because it is the nearest thing to an absolute parallel to our present situation. It is exactly the same in principle. The Roman Empire fell for the same reason that we are trying valiantly to destroy our own way of life. But we can from learning, perhaps uh, from Spangler's Decline of the West, or other good texts that are coming out now, realize our mistakes. We can realize that it is not going to be through violence and not through dependence upon political reform changes are going to come. They're going to come by the individual becoming more enlightened. In order to have an enlightened government, you have must have enlightened people who not only are enlightened enough to elect a good government, but are enlightened enough to be good governors when they are elected. You can't just drift this situation. So the problem of revelation comes through the individual waking up. Revelation is an awakening. It is a becoming aware. It is beginning to see into things instead of their surfaces only. It is the beginning of a responsible relationship with existence. Revelation shows us what is expected, what is demanded, and what is inevitable in a universe governed by absolute law. But Revelation shows that this law is not only legistic, it is also very deeply emotionally constructed. Law is not only a legal code, but it is a basic relationship based upon love of God and love of our fellow men. So love is part of law. And without love, law can never be fulfilled. But without law, love can never be brought to fruition. These things are related. And it is only self-discipline that keeps us in harmony with law. And it is also self-discipline that perfects love. These things are intimately interrelated. So in this search for the solution, we have to begin with the problem of our own nature. We have had a stream of dictators lately that have drenched the earth with blood. And these dictators have nearly always been usurpers of some kind. They are people that have risen up uh, to, in many cases probably, to accomplish what they believe to be a useful change in society. Napoleon was one of those who had a divinity complex. He believed that God had appointed him to save the world. There is no doubt in the world that Mussolini had the same type of attitude, and so did Hitler. They were strangely uh, imbalanced mystics who felt in some way the pressure of a destiny. Uh, of course, we can hardly say that Karl Marx was dominated by the God complex, but he also regarded himself as a man of destiny, but without permission of deity, because he probably gravely doubted the existence of deity. But all these people, of various reasons, at various times in their careers, really believed they were doing something to help people. Now bring this now into yourself. 
somewhere in yourself is this dictatorial factor. It's usually located somewhere between the ears. <laughs> and this faculty is the part that it, it determines what is good. Well, most people start out in families and in relationships. They want to do what is good. They want to help people to be better. But it's hard to help people to be better when you do not know what better is yourself. So better really almost always means conformity. To conform with what the better thinking person thinks better is. And it ends in tyranny. It ends in one superstition being imposed upon another. And where the blind lead the blind, they all fall in the ditch together. So to uh, work with this tyranny that is within ourselves, we have to educate it. Nearly all the dictators have been badly educated. They've had very little experience with value. An individual who is educated but locked within his own attitudes can be in the same condition. He is in this condition because although he has a proper background for learning, he has never used it. He has subjected his background of learning to the foreground of his own opinion. If we are then trying to, to work to solve this problem in ourselves and in society, we come around finally to the realization that something has to open up the inner life of the individual. Now let's bring that down to our present situation also. In the last ten years, the world in general has changed its attitude toward knowledge very substantially. It has been a period of, of astonishing religious renaissance. More and more people have turned to some kind of faith. Twenty-five years ago, religion was regarded as little better than a superstition. Today, religion is spreading in every part of the world because revolutions are beginning to add up to revelations. The individual and the collective together must realize that violence is no solution, but that the answer to all problems lies in the recognition of the spiritual foundation of society. One of the reasons, perhaps, that we have had some new attitudes on these things has been the importation of other religions from other parts of the world we've at last come to the realization that no one religion is the only one. And that from other religions we can learn much, but at the same time can stay with our own if we so desire. It doesn't mean that we have to be a traitor to one belief in order to join another. This influx of foreign religions has brought with it a strong mystical overtone. For well, most of these faiths are far more mystical than ours at the present time. Another situation has developed that is important, and that is that science, having become pra practically uh, at the end of its resources, as far as further explorations are concerned, has begun finally to systematically examine the internal light of the human being. Science is now beginning to work with the extrasensory perception bands. It is working with all kinds of man's internal experience phenomena and is beginning to recognize that until it understands man's mystical constitution, it can never produce a, a truly workable psychotherapy. We will never have a true psychology until the individual is able to explore and classify the internal phenomena of his own consciousness. 
Now the whole theory motive creeps in on this also. Some of this research is now being intended primarily for exploitation. And the various schools that are claiming it are some of them already falling into exploiting techniques. But the major over pattern is very good. It is that man is beginning to recognize what he forgot 2,000 years ago, and that is the mystery of his own inner life. He is beginning to restore the structure of the mysteries and their philosophies and their teachings. A simple example has been acupuncture, which came in as a superstition and is now established as a valid form of science. We are suddenly beginning to realize the fact that our ancestors long ago were not fools. There's a man by the name of Salbertes who wrote a book, and in it he attempted to expose the miracles of antiquity. They were all frauds. But in order to explain them and maintain his own point of view, he had to create an antiquity as highly advanced in science as we are today because to produce the phenomena without metaphysical means required advancement of science beyond anything that we know. So he caught himself in his own trap. He points out, for example, that the ancients had androids, statues that spoke, moved, and performed services. Uh, they had talking heads that could add up compl uh, complicated digital numbers. In other words, they had a primary computer. Long before we believed there were such things. One of the early kings of Rome, who lived more than a thousand B.C., was, ex was killed by an electrical experiment in his own laboratory. These people knew drugs. They knew all the drugs that we now use in psychotherapy. They had all kinds of magnetic and electric devices. And in order to prove his point, he made the ancients so smart that we never will catch up with them. But the point that is perhaps valid from both standpoints of view is that in those days, all of this knowledge was concentrated in a group of persons who were able to direct it for the common good and prevent its misuse by oaths and obligations. So that during that entire period of time, there is no evidence that the sciences of, act, of antiquity were exploited in the same degree that modern sciences are exploited today. It is a, again a case question of the individual gradually making the changes in himself that are necessary. The modern trend in metaphysics could result, and probably will result, in the gradual unfold of those parts of man's own internal nature, which will ultimately free him from all pollution, from all exploitation, uh, from the danger of nuclear warfare, and all of this type of thing. He can release from within himself everything that is necessary for his physical security and at the same time free his consciousness for the advancement of knowledge. This was Lord Bacon's dream, that in the end all science would free individuals from the responsibilities resulting from abuse and ignorance that science would rescue the person from the dilemma of his own mistakes. But this can only come when science stops making the mistakes also. And it can only do this when it has become ensouled. 
and modern science exploring into the mysteries of light, energy, time, matter, spirit, mind, all of these things, science goes on, it's going to discover some answers. And as it discovers these, it will begin to re regain what it had in the beginning, the realization that all science is a science of understanding the nature and function of deity. When this time comes, and these things are seen in this way, uh, we will be able to accomplish much more than we have ever accomplished before. And the first step that we probably should begin to take is to realize what is intended. And whether it is in this present embodiment or in some future life, each of us is, has to be part of this great plan of human regeneration. And in order to do it, we can start now on the process of disciplining our faculties and gaining the freedom that comes from being free from our own mistakes. When we do this, we will have a very much better time. And uh, we will find that there is no end in sight that will block the universe or destroy it. Because all of its true values are immortal and indestructible. And only thing that we can destroy in the long run is ignorance. We can only destroy destructiveness itself. And out of that will come the answers to the things we want. And when that time comes, and we are citizens of a better world, it will be necessary for us to be better citizens. For we cannot administer the fairness, the equality, the integrity that is gradually unfolding through humanity unless as individuals we can stand firm for principles at all times and become worthy of the securities that we hope to attain. Well, that's all for morning, folks.